I want to talk today about what is sometimes known as the paradox of voting, Condorcet's paradox. It was discovered by the Marquis de Condorcet in 1785. The idea behind the paradox is that even if everybody involved is entirely rational, if they satisfy basic principles of rationality, still the group, through voting, may not end up having a rational position. That is to say, individual rationality sometimes cannot combine to form group rationality. Now, that's a surprising result, and there are many related results in contemporary social choice theory. Arrow's theorem really contains Condorcet's paradox as the crucial move in the proof. And a similar thing is true, I think, of the gibbard satterthwaite theorem and a variety of other results in social choice theory. Collective rationality is more complicated and more difficult to achieve than individual rationality. The rationality of the individuals in a group does not guarantee the group's rationality. Well, here's how the paradox goes. Suppose we have three options and three voters. As soon as that happens, we are in trouble. It turns out that even if we adopt a rather ordinary sort of decision procedure like majority voting, we get into trouble. Now, some have taken this paradox to indicate that there's a basic problem about majority voting, but what the extensions in social choice theory show is that actually it's not just majority voting. Any voting system ends up violating basic principles of rationality sometimes. So let's take a look at how the paradox unfolds. Let's call our voters 1, 2, and 3. And let's call our options A, B, and C. So voter 1 has a different preference ordering among those three options. A is first choice, B second choice, C third choice. Voter 2 also has very clearly defined preferences. B is 2's first choice, C the second choice, A the last choice. And finally, we get voter 3, who prefers C. C is the first choice, A the second choice, B the third choice. Now, let's suppose we have majority voting. What's the result? Well, we can't really easily combine all of A, B, and C. In fact, it's hard to say what would happen if we did. Suppose we just allowed all three options on the table and each voted for the first choice. It would just end up being a tie. One vote for A, one vote for B, one vote for C. Suppose we let them just rule out one option. Well, again, one would rule out A, one would rule out B, one would rule out C. We wouldn't really get any decision. We'd just end up with ties. So suppose we take these options in pairs. First, we just test A versus B. Those two options, which do you prefer? Voter 1 says, my choices are A, B, and C in that order. A is my first choice, so I vote A. Voter 2 says, well, my choices are B, C, and A. A is my last choice, but B is my first choice, so I vote B. Voter 3 has the options C, A, and B. So C is voter 3's first choice. A is the second choice. They prefer A to B, so they vote for A over B. In short, two of our three voters prefer A to B, so A wins. Now let's take options B and C. Voter 1 prefers B, and so votes B. Voter 2 prefers B, first choice, so votes B. And only voter 3 has the opposite preference and votes for C. So B beats C, 2 to 1. Now suppose we took the other pair. We took A and C. So far we have that A beats B and B beats C. Hmm, it would seem to follow, by transitivity, that A should beat C. After all, if A is better than B and B is better than C, A must be better than C, right? Well, not so fast. Let's just take that pair of options, A and C. What do they prefer? Voter 1 is very clear. A is one's first choice. C is one's last choice. So, voter 1 votes for A. Now, Voter 2 prefers B to C, but C to A. 
And so, just given a choice between C and A, votes for C. Now it's all up to voter 3. Voter 3 has C as their first choice. And so they, of course, between A and C, vote C. The result of all that is that A beats B, B beats C, and C beats A. We have a cycle. And so even though each individual person has entirely rational preferences, they aren't cyclic, there's nothing weird about them, A over B over C, etc. No, instead we combine all of these through majority voting, taking them pairwise, and we end up getting a cycle. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, if we don't take them pairwise, if we allow all three in, well then, we just get ties. So we either get no decision at all, or we seem to get a case of group irrationality. It turns out that A beats B, B beats C, C beats A. Now, this has some important practical consequences. For one thing, it will mean that if we introduce these in order, that is to say, we first take some pair of them, that choice of initial pair to vote on actually determines the outcome. So it matters hugely which we decide to vote on first. Now, I think this is in general true in legislatures, in meetings of any kind. It matters hugely which issues are brought to the table first. And so a clever person can actually set things up to get the outcome they want by thinking through very, very carefully which ordering of the options is going to produce the right kind of outcome. And if somebody makes a motion from the floor and disrupts that, it can seriously change the group outcome. And again, everybody in the group is rational, but it will turn out that the decision of the group is dependent on the order in which various things are considered, which doesn't sound like a very important kind of consideration. It's nothing about the options themselves. It's just the order we think about them, but it will determine the outcome. So in this case, notice if we take A and B first, then A ends up winning, defeating B, but then we say, okay, take A versus C, C ends up winning. So we first decide we're going to make a decision between A and B, C ends up winning. Suppose we instead say, well, let's start with taking B versus C. Then it turns out B defeats C. So then we take A and B and A defeats B. So it will turn out if we start with a vote on B versus C, A ends up winning. What about taking A versus C first? Well, then as we've seen, surprisingly, C beats A. So then we face off B and C and B ends up winning. So if we start by voting on A versus C, B wins. The choice of initial contest determines the outcome. And in each case, notice it's the one that gets, as it were, a buy in the first round that isn't considered initially that ends up winning the day. Now, research has shown that Condorcet's paradox in larger groups actually rarely occurs. After all, it has to be a special kind of arrangement of options and voter preferences to yield this kind of cyclic outcome. On the other hand, the general phenomenon that the order in which we consider various choices will determine the outcome, or at least have a large effect on the outcome, that's something that is much more broadly applicable. And anybody who leads meetings, anybody who is Speaker of the House, or President Pro Tem of the Senate, or simply a department chair, or in any other way chairing some kind of meeting, needs to be aware of this, because it will turn out that the group sometimes really cannot reach a rational outcome, given the preferences of the people in the group, that luckily is relatively rare, but it often happens that the outcome of the meeting is going to depend on the order in which various issues are considered. So the order of votes will end up mattering, and it can matter even if we aren't in that special situation which produces this kind of cyclic outcome. So Condorcet's paradox is something that is a surprising result. It leads to deep conclusions about the possibility of group rationality, 
but it also makes a difference practically for anyone who's leading a group trying to make a decision. Be very, very careful because minor changes in the order of the agenda, for example, can end up playing a role in what the group eventually decides.